Whether it's the social media you consume or the news feed you watch, we're all under the influence. We trust the gram to gain our knowledge. We look to the news to teach us how to treat our neighbor. We scroll and scroll looking for something more. The truth of this world is here today and gone tomorrow. But the truth of God's word will last forever. What's your feed feeding you? Hey, Christ Fellowship, how are we doing today? Want to welcome everybody joining us at all of our Christ Fellowship locations. Everybody joining us here at the Gardens Campus. We love you guys, everybody online. So good to have you with us. Hey, before we jump into the message today, I want to give you an update on where we are with our Heart for the House offering that we've been given over the last couple of weeks. Is that okay that I do that? Because let me tell you, we had more people jump in and be a part of this Heart for the House offering than any other time before. And together we've given more than we've ever given before for this work that God's called us to. So I, I'm so excited to share this with you. Are you ready? You ready to hear it? Royal Palms, Phil Hersey, Lucy Gardens, Rivera Beach, Boca. Come on, let me hear it. You ready? We need a drum roll. Okay, together. In commitments and offering, we've given $10,410,809.78. Come on. Woo! That's awesome, man. I want us to pray over that offering because that's holy. Every dollar and the 78 cents is holy to God, amen? And we're gonna use it to reach people with the love and the message of Jesus Christ. So Father, take this offering that we've all been giving and sacrificing towards, and we pray that you would use it to make your love and your name famous. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Come on, let's thank God again one more time for that offering we gave together. So we're kicking off a brand new series this week called TikTok Theology, and we're asking the question, what's your feed feeding you? What is Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and social media, how is it influencing your thinking and specifically your theology? Now theology is just what we think about when we think about God. That word theology comes from two Greek words, theos, that means God, and logos, that means word or rational thought. And so theology is simply your God thought. And can I say this? Everybody's got a theology. Even the atheist has a theology. And your theology actually shapes the way you live life. Because here's what I know. Um, if you don't think about God very much, that's going to shape your life. Or if you think that God is distant from you or absent or angry with you, well, then that will shape your life. But if you see God as a part of every part of your life, if you see God as a very present help in time of trouble or need, if you see God as the creator of the universe and the creator of life that best knows how to help you get the most out of life, well then that's gonna shape how you do life. It shapes every part of your life. The theologian A.W. Tozer said this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about us because it shapes our life. And as your pastor, I'm afraid that too many people, too many Christians are getting their theology, their God thought from places that are not godly. I don't think we realize just how much these things influence our thinking. This is the new iPhone 26 right here. <laughs> they just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, I don't think we understand how those small little devices in your pocket or your purse have a huge impact on your thinking and your life. We spend hours scrolling and tweeting and tapping and liking and posting and, and reading. It, it actually, uh, researchers have, have shown that uh, the average person spends two hours a day or more on social media apps and checks their phone 344 times every day for notifications. And some of you know somebody that's way above average, right? <laughs> You're sitting next to them, nudging on that. Now you may not have TikTok on your phone, but there's a good chance that if you have a smartphone that you've got something on there, some apps that help you 
stay up to date with what's happening in the world, what's happening with friends and family. It might be Instagram, it might be Facebook. Uh, it might be some news feeds that help you stay in touch with current events of what's happening in the world. Um, my my go-to is um, Instagram. Let's see if I can get it up. Oh, Julie's texting me. Hold on a second. Hey, babe. Hey. All right, just say. So when you go to when you go to Instagram. I can see what's happening at Hive Bakery, what they're, what they're cooking this week. I love that bakery. I can get a, a quote from an inspirational little feed from somebody. This is sisterhood. It's so good. I can check on Nate Horseman, my friend and Tessa, who just had their baby, Etta. I mean, there's so many things you can do with your phone. And there's funny videos of animals that you can watch for hours, right? You, you, you can check on uh, blogs and posts and what your favorite sports team is doing or how they're doing, right? Moment of silence for the Miami Heat. I know, but this thing is filled with people's opinions of what's happening in the world, filled with political arguments back and forth of what you should think and how you should feel about the latest tragedies that are happening in our, in our nation. And it's not just social media, it's literally all media trying to influence your thinking. Media doesn't just inform you of stuff. Their job isn't just to give you information. Their job is to influence your, your thought. I can't tell you how many conversations I've been in with somebody that have been telling me something about what's happening in the world or uh, uh, some crazy perspective on something. I'm like, hey, where did you find that? And they pull out their phone and they send me a link to a blog or a post or a tweet. Can I tell you, just because somebody tweeted, it doesn't mean it's true. All right, once you tweet that, right? <laughs> just because it's on somebody's real, doesn't make it real. If you wanna know what's real, Jesus said in John chapter eight, he said, you will know the truth, say that part with me, and the truth will set you free. He's not saying, any old truth, not TikTok truth. He's saying the truth, that there is truth. And when you know that truth and you live that truth out, that truth will actually bring freedom into your life. But the problem we have going on in the world today is this thing called relativism, that all truth is relative, which basically means if it's true for you, then it's good for you. And what's true for me is good for me. Relativism declares that there are no absolute truths, which is absolutely illogical. It's crazy, like even when they make the statement, there is no absolute truth, they're actually making an absolute statement right there. They're like, that's what I'm, I just wanna go, are you absolutely sure? Because you just said it, right? Relativism is self-defeating. The very statement, if, you, if, if all truth is relative is true, then their very statement about truth being relative isn't even true, right? I mean, it's not even logical. The world operates on absolutes every single day. You, you go into the pharmacist with a prescription and you hand that to the pharmacy, pharmacist, you wanna make sure that the pharmacist gives you exactly what's on that piece of paper. You don't want him to go, oh, I don't really have that, but here's something for your back. Good luck. No, 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 you absolutely want the prescription in the absolute right dosage, right? Or it could hurt you. Stop signs. Stop signs, the rule on stop signs doesn't mean you don't have to absolutely stop. Just do whatever you're feeling. No, well, some of you treat it that way, but that's not what you're supposed to do, right? What if, what if there were no absolute laws about traffic laws? What if red lights didn't mean you had to absolutely stop? Just if you're in a hurry, we got, you, know, you don't feel like stopping, just go. It'd be chaos. No, no, no. The world operates on absolutes every single day. See, our culture has come to value tolerance over truth. To the point that if you are truthful, oftentimes you are viewed as intolerant. How dare you say that is true and this is wrong? How dare you say that is the right way and this is, how dare you? you who put you in judge and made you judge not lest you be judged, right? And then they quote the very man who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Problem is the world has redefined tolerance. Tolerance used to mean that we could disagree about something and we would treat each other with respect because we both are made in the image of God. And so even though we may disagree morally or politically, we're still polite with one another. T today, tolerance has come to mean 
that all thoughts are equally valid, which is, you want another absolute? That's absolutely crazy, because not all thoughts are equally valid. I can say that the earth rotates around the sun. Another person can say the sun, no, 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 it rotates around the earth. Those are not two equally valid thoughts. There are absolute truths in the world, and we gotta know them. If you don't know the truth, you will fall for a lie every time. Now, before we unpack what truth is, it's important to know what, what truth is not. First of all, truth uh, is not what you feel. Your feelings are valid. They're just not always right. You know what I'm saying? And think about it, your feelings change all the time. So if you base truth on what you feel, well then one day it's gonna be one thing and two months later it's gonna be another thing. Where else in the world does that work? Well, it just feels right to me, so it must be right. Just down in my feeler, I just, it feels. So that's what I'm going with. What? Try that the next time the police officer pulls you over. And you say, well, I didn't feel like I was doing 85 miles an hour. He's gonna say, well, my little gun here says you were doing, your radar shows you were doing that, right? Try that with, when your teacher hands back the test and you go, oh, I, I feel like I should have a better grade. She's probably gonna look at you and go, I feel like you should probably study a little bit more, Jack. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't work. It's not what you feel, your feelings change. So truth isn't what you feel. Truth, truth also isn't what society decides or culture decides. It, uh, we don't get to decide, just let's all vote on it and see what we wanna do. No, no, no. It doesn't matter what Anderson Cooper or Sean Hannity or whoever you listen to says. That doesn't mean it's true. Test all things, test all spirits, test it against the truth. Just because a Kardashian says it doesn't mean it's true. In fact, if a Kardashian says it, it probably isn't true. You know what I'm saying, right? You gotta know the truth or you will believe a lie every time. We, we don't look to Hollywood to help us determine what is right and wrong. Just because they're a good actor or a great athlete doesn't mean they know what is right and wrong. Don't listen to them for truth. Don't let them influence your truth. Don't let them shape your theology and your thinking. Even what we vote on, y'all, just because it is politically correct doesn't mean it's biblically correct. Do you hear what I'm saying? So we do not let culture decide. Truth is not what culture decides. And the last one is that truth is not circumstantial. Well, Todd, We've evolved as a people, so now we can just redefine what marriage is and we can redefine identity and we can, re no, 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 no. God's already defined all that. He's already defined all that, so, so we're, it's not circumstantial. It, it's not, it doesn't change, it's not changing by the situation. That's called situational ethics. Well, it's okay to lie in these kind of circumstances because it, you know, you know it's okay to cheat on my taxes here because you know, it's kind of tight, the government takes too much money and it, no, 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 no. Truth is not a moving target. When truth becomes a moving target, then our life is unstable in all our ways. The Apostle Paul says this in Ephesians 4. And I, I, my prayer is that you would receive, I've been praying about this series for months. I've been praying about this lesson for months. I've been praying that we as a church would not fall into the deception of the world's thinking and the patterns of the world's thinking. And some of us are there. And so this series and this message is to help pull us out of that and help us to see light and truth so that we can live the life God's created us to live. That's my heart behind this. So this is what Paul says. He says, let us no longer be like children, forever changing our minds about what we believe because someone has told us something different or has cleverly lied to us. And look at that last part. And made the lie sound like the truth, boy, that's happening every day on this thing right here in your pocket. Every day, people are making the lie sound like a truth. But can I tell you, there is something that is powerful that happens when you know the truth. When you have the right theology, the right thinking about God, it leads to the right thinking about yourself and about your life. It leads to how you face problems and it changes everything in your life. It changes your relationships. It, it helps you stand out in an upside down world where everybody's saying this is right and that's right. You stand out above it all. One of my favorite uh, stories in the Bible, uh, in fact, it's in my top five 
Bible stories in the whole Bible. I love this. And if you've been around Christ Fellowship, we've read this and studied this passage before. I want to look at it from a new perspective. It's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These guys are legends. Men, you know, if you've been a part of crew, we've been studying uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and how we can be men that stand up, stand together, stand out when everything else is turned upside down. So these were three of the Israelites that were carried off into captivity into Babylon. And because they were of nobility or royal birth, they were put into the service of the king of Babylon. But right from the beginning when they went, they were just teenagers. They made the decision that they were not gonna let the culture of Babylon get into them. They made the decision that even though they were going to be in a godless culture, the godless culture was not gonna get into them. So years later, after they made that decision, and they came up with the Daniel fast, which many of us have done, hey, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar builds this huge statue out of gold, and he says every time the music plays, everybody has to stop what they're doing, bow down and worship this statue. So that happened, music played, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow down. They're like, no, we're not bowing down and worshiping that, we worship God. We're not gonna do this thing. Well, the king finally hears about it that some of his own, those closest to him were not bowing down and worshiping. He gets mad and this is what it says. He gets furious at them and brings them before him. And in verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego reply to the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, that was the punishment that if you didn't bow down, you would be thrown into this blazing, fiery furnace. He said, even if you're thrown in the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Now there's so much in the tone of what they say right there. They're not being rude. They're not being disrespectful. They're just being confident in the fact that they know something that King Nebuchadnezzar doesn't know, right? But you, you can actually be 100% truthful and 100% filled with grace at the same time. Did you know that? Did you, did you know that, that when you are 100% truth and 100% grace, you are most like Jesus? Do you know that some people grab a hold of truth and they weaponize it? <laughs> Just to cut somebody else down, trying to make a point. Well, you might make a point, but you're not gonna make a difference. You gotta decide which one you're gonna make, right? So these guys, they're saying God's gonna deliver us, that's faith, and even if he doesn't, we're still not gonna bow down. That's, that's a beautiful thing called commitment that even if God doesn't answer my prayer the way I want him to, I'm not gonna give up on God. Some of us could learn a lesson right there. Well, this enraged the king so much that he turned the fire up seven times more, five, seven times greater, hotter than it was before. They bound Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the guards that threw them into the furnace uh, burned up themselves. And it says, just a few verses down, Verse 24, King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement. He asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw in the fire? They replied, certainly your majesty. Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. There was another in the fire, standing there. That's where that song comes from, right there, right? Now we've studied this, this verse many times before, but today I want you to see it in the context of, of truth and what having the right theology, the right God thought, how that impacts every part of your life. These guys, they, they knew the truth. And so even though they were in captivity, they were not held captive by a lie. See, when you know the truth, there's a couple things that happens. First, when you know the truth, it makes you strong. There is a strength that comes when you know what is right and what is wrong. There's a stability in life that no matter what comes against you, you are anchored, you are, you are building your life on the cornerstone of Christ Jesus. He is a solid rock, a firm foundation. In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, after Jesus uh, preaches his greatest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, longest recorded message we have of Jesus, at the very end in chapter seven, he says, if you build your life on these teachings, you are like a wise man that builds his house on a firm rock. And when the winds and the waves come, it doesn't even shake the foundations, the house stands. But if you're foolish, you don't, you don't build your life on these truths that I'm telling you about. Then you're like a foolish man that builds his house on the sand. And as soon as the, the winds and the waves and the storms come, man, that whole thing falls apart. So he says, build your life on my foundation, on this truth. Man, the truth makes you strong. Can I tell you, there, there have been times in my life when um, 
I didn't feel strong in my faith. Where Julie and I had been walking through things and situations and problems, things we're, been, we're praying for, we were praying for, for for a season of time and nothing seemed to change. In fact, it just seemed to get worse and worse and worse. It had to do with our son Jefferson. And let me just say, uh, parents, you know what I'm talking about. There's no pain like kid pain. Like there's nothing like it. And I remember at times just being so like not this, not weak. And I was listening to all my fears and all my worries and all my concerns and thinking about what I had to do as the dad to try to fix something or, or create something different. And I remember praying in situations like this and, and going, God, I, I'm at my end. I don't even know what to do here. I am so weak. And the Spirit of God speaking back to me so clearly saying, Todd, in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. You don't have to be strong because I'm strong. I've got Jefferson, I've got you, i got you all in the palm of my hand. I'm already in his future, I already know what's going. And in those moments, I remind myself of the truth. I remind myself that he who began a good work in Jefferson is faithful to complete it. So I don't need to worry. I don't need to stress out about that situation or that need. I need to rely on my God. And all of a sudden, as I started reminding myself of truth, I felt the strength of my spirit come back, rise up back on the inside of me. Because what? Truth makes you strong. The second thing I see in this story is that truth makes you bold. Man, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were bold. They were not intimidated by King Nebi and his, pro, his fire, they, the fire pit. They got the marshmallows out. They're like, come on, let's, mar let's roast something here, right? We're gonna have some s'mores or something. They were just like, they were not intimidated at all. When you know the truth, it makes you bold. Do you remember when you were in school and you knew the answer to, to a question that the teacher asked and you'd be like, oh, <laughs> right, right? Because you knew. So it made you confident because you, you, oh, I know that, right? The same is true in life. When you know truth, when it is down deep in your soul, when your life is built on that truth, it gives you a boldness and a confidence to not let anything hold you back. And I believe that one of the number one tools of the enemy is to try to intimidate you to try to keep you back and full of fear and anxiety. Well, what if, what if that happens? And what if I step out and what if I fail? And what if, and all of a sudden we're kept back from stepping out and trusting God and knowing God and following God into the big life that God has for us to live. When you know the truth, it makes you bold. And the third thing I see from this story is that when you know the truth, it actually makes you contagious. What you know, how you live, it actually starts to get on to other people, right? At the end of Daniel chapter three, when, they, when King Nebuchadnezzar pulls them out, he says, come on out, guys, come out. And he says this in, in verse 26, come out, you servants of the most high God. Like he actually is calling God the most high God. The fire had not touched these men. Not a hair on their head was singed. They did not even smell like smoke. Can I tell you that God wants to bring you through the fires of life and you don't even smell like smoke? Like you are not marked by the trial, you're not marked by the pain, you are marked by his presence. You are marked by the stability of his faithfulness in your life. That so marks your life that people see that in your life and they're like, I want that. I need some of that for me, right? And King Nebuchadnezzar goes on to decree that there's no other God like their God. He says it right in front of everybody, right? And, and the king starts praising God right there in front of all the people. Why? Because their faith and their confidence and they knew the truth, it was, it was contagious and it, impact, it impacted a godless nation. When you and I know the truth and we live that truth out, it is gonna impact a godless nation. It's gonna expose God. So we have gotta live the truth. But you can't live the truth if you don't know the truth. You gotta know the truth. And you may say, well, Todd, how do I, how do I know? I know where you're going with this. Like, how do I know the truth when the world is sending me all these different messages, when this person says this is okay, and that person says that is okay, how can, can I really know truth? And I want you to be perfectly clear today to know that you can know truth because you can know Jesus. And Jesus is the truth. He says, I am the way, the life, the tr I'm the truth. You can build your life on me. In fact, when he was standing before Pontius Pilate, he said this in John chapter 18, he says, the reason I was born and came into the world, look at that, is to testify to truth. The reason I was born 
and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. He came to reveal God, to reveal truth to each one of us. John chapter one, this this gospel starts off by saying, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. And then in verse 14 it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Speaking of Jesus, so every time you get into the word, he came to testify to truth, you are getting into Jesus. Every time the word is getting into you, his truth is getting into you. It's building that firm foundation on your life. See, in the search for truth, you've gotta ask yourself a fundamental question. Every person has to ask this question. Christian, non-Christian, Baptist, Buddhist, everybody gotta ask the question. What is going to be the authority in my life? What will be the basis, the foundation for my belief and therefore my behavior? What will that be? And and let me just cut to the chase. You've got two choices. It's either the world or the word. That's all you got. You got got what the world says or what the word says. And you may say, wait a minute, Todd, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. What about me? Why can't I be my own authority for my life. Can I tell you? It's because you don't know what you don't know. You don't know everything about life. You don't, what, if you just go by what you know or what you think, woo, there's a, think about all the stuff you don't know. You don't even know what you don't know and what you don't know can hurt you, right? Have you ever played the game um, Scrabble and somebody tries to play a word that you're like, nah, that is not a word. And they look back at you and go, no, no, no. Snitzernugan is a word. I use it all the time. And you're like, no, you don't. You are lying to me to try to get 250 points. It's like, no, 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 Snitzernugan. I ate Snitzernugan for, no, you didn't. What do you do? Well, in that moment, you appeal to a higher authority, the dictionary. And if the dictionary doesn't have Snitzernugan in it, you ain't getting your 250 points, Jack, right? It's just, it's, that's the way it goes. So it is with God and life. We have to appeal to a higher authority. And what is it gonna be? Is it gonna be what the world says, politics says, or what the word of God says? The problem is the opinion of the world is changing all the time. Oh my goodness, what's in today is out tomorrow, right? And it'll come back in 20 years. Bell bottoms are back. That's crazy, right? If you lived during the 80s and you were a girl, a teenager in high school, Julie, you would tease your bangs up They'd be like eight inches off the top of your head like that because Julia Roberts did it once or something. I don't know, right? They were just following the trends. The question is, are you gonna build your life on trend or on truth? You get to choose. That's what's great, you get to choose. But trends change. But the word of God remains forever. It says this in Isaiah 40 verse eight, the grass withers and the flowers fall. Say that last part with me out loud. But the word of God stands forever. It says in Psalm 119 that all your words are true, O God. All your laws are right. They last forever. And again, you may say, but Todd, how do we know for sure that the Bible is the word of God? There is so much proof. I could spend the next three weeks talking to you about the proof of the word of God. Do you know that this Bible is written by 40 different authors from shepherds to kings, to peasants, to fishermen, poets, written across three continents during a span of more than 15 hundred years and all throughout from the beginning to the end, from Genesis to Revelation, it has one theme. God's relentless pursuit of you and me because he wants to have a relationship with us. We see it over and over and over again. On top of that, there is three things. Authors, eyewitness accounts. The authors were eyewitnesses. Like they saw this thing happen. It says this in in 1 Peter 1.16. We didn't base our message on clever myths that we made up. Rather, we witnessed his majesty Say that part with me, with our own eyes. They were there, they saw it, they witnessed it, right? Now, the second proof that we know this is is the word of God is there was a short period of transmission 
a short period of time from the time when they witnessed something to when they wrote it down, okay? Now, scholars say it was sometimes the shortest would be right around 20 years, maybe 30 years, and then be on there. So you may think, well, that's a long time. That's like, that's a couple decades, Todd. Like, I can't remember what happened a couple decades ago. Can I ask you who sang Billy Jean in my who, who did it? Who? Who was it? Who was it, Royal Palm? Port St. Lucie? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, finish, finish this line for me. Don't break my heart. I, yeah, Okeechobee probably sang that the loudest today, yeah. <laughs> Those songs are like 20, 30 years ago. And yet you remember every word. So don't you think if you saw a dead person raised back to life, you'd remember the details about it? Don't you think if you saw blinded eyes open or the cripple get up and start running around the temple, you'd remember every stinking detail and you go write that down. The third proof of accuracy is the accuracy of the manuscripts. Do you know the Bible is the most reinforced, reliable, historical document known to mankind. It has more proof of accuracy and reliability than if you go back to the, the 10 oldest pieces of literature in the world. Like, I can't even say these people's names. Herodot Herodotus, his work on the histories has eight manuscript copies. Thucyd yeah, that guy, he has eight copies of his. He's a, he's a Roman historian. And then Tacitus has 20 copies. Do you know how many copies? You can go back. New Testament, there it is. 24,300 copies of the New Testament alone. And they all perfectly align to prove that this word is reliable. You can trust this word. But can I give you, can I give you the greatest proof that this word is the word of God? It has the power to change lives. It has the power to set captives free to break chains of addiction of people that have wandered around for years bound up and then they encounter the living word and all of a sudden they have life again. This word is the living, breathing, active word of God. It is filled with God's presence and God's promises for our life. When you need wisdom, you can turn to the word. When you don't know which way to go, you can turn to the word. This word has everything that you and I need if we'll just open it up and, and read it and build our life upon it, build our life on the truth. It is the source of truth that you and I can build a firm foundation on. This is the only book that tells you about God, about you, about what life really matters and means. There's no other book on the planet that has this for us. You can't find that anywhere else. So don't, don't let somebody's tweet determine your truth. Don't let somebody else's ideology shape your theology. This is the only one God, through his spirit, can shape and speak, help us see right from wrong and know which way to go. So I have a challenge for you. This week, I wanna challenge you to look for the three lies that your feed is feeding you. And let me tell you, it will not be hard to find it. Three lies that culture, your feed, is trying to feed you. And then I want you to do a little homework. I want you to open up your Bible and dig through it and find the scripture that combats the lie. Because if you don't learn how to do that on your own, you will believe a lie every time. You have to learn on your own how to go, when you hear something, go, no, 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 I'm I'm putting that through the filter of the word of God. I may not even know exactly where that scripture is, but I'm gonna go dig for it. I'm gonna find it. I'm gonna ask the Holy Spirit to guide me to truth and understanding so that I'm not swayed back and forth by what everybody else is saying and what everybody else is doing, but I'm building my life on the foundation of God's word. And I tell you, as you learn to do that, you'll find the truth. And this truth will bring freedom into every part of your life. I wanna pray two prayers for us today. Prayer number one is I'm gonna be praying that all of our eyes get opened up this week. Like that you see the lies, like they just pop out and you go, wait. I want, I'm praying for revelation and then I'm praying that you will be able to have the determination to find the truth. The second prayer that I wanna pray for those of you that maybe you've been following a lie for a long time, thinking that you can do life on your own, go on your own, do your own thing, but can I tell you the truth? You need Jesus. 
And you need to experience a personal relationship with him and walk with him every day. And when his spirit comes into your life, it will open your eyes. He will guide you to truth and guide you to life. But that only happens by you personally opening up your life to him. And maybe you've never done that or maybe you've never given him full control. Today's the day for you to do that so that you can build your life on the truth. Would you pray with me today? Father God, I thank you for your word that is truth, that is appropriate for correcting us when we're thinking wrong and challenging us and convicting us and helping us find our way. I pray that God, this week, you would open our eyes to see the lies that are all around us. And then I pray that you would expose those lies with the truth of your word. Give us eyes to see. As we continue to pray with every head bowed, if you're here today and you want to step into that relationship with Jesus, or maybe you need to reaffirm and redeclare that that he is the Lord of your life today because you know today your relationship isn't where it needs to be, I'm going to pray the second prayer. And if you would say, Todd, would you include me in this prayer? Right where you are, would you raise your hand up? Whether you're at home, whether you're at another location today here at Gardens, raise them up high. I want to see them all over the place. And you, this is your prayer. We're all going to pray together. But those of you with your hands up, this is your prayer today. Just pray this. Say, dear Lord Jesus. Come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. I declare you are Lord and Savior. And and I will follow you the best I know how for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, let's thank God today for all those that made that decision to follow Jesus. Thanks for joining us for this week's service. We pray that God has used this time to really impact your life. Yeah, but it doesn't have to end here. There are actually two ways that you can take this time into the rest of the week. First, you can share. Share in the comments what God spoke to you during this message and then press the share button and send this to a friend who could use some encouragement. Second, get connected. Whether it's by pressing the subscribe button so that you get notified when new messages go live or by joining our Facebook group through the link in the description. Our team wants to learn how we can equip you with the right resources and encouragement to live the full life that God has in store for you. Yeah, and finally, you can also be a part of everything we're doing together to share the hope and the message of Jesus Christ by clicking the Give Now link in the description below. So your financial partnership, it's gonna allow us to reach even more people around the world for Jesus and help them to step into the full life that they were created for. Absolutely. Thank you again for watching. God bless.